Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual author lecture with Richard J. Lazarus, author of The Rule of Five. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Tuesday, April 27th at 1 p.m., Joshua D. Rothman will tell us about his new book, The Ledger and the Chain, a study of America's internal slave trade and its role in the making of America. And on Thursday, April 29th at noon, we'll hear from John Grinspan, author of The Age of Acrimony, an examination of 19th century America's unruly politics. Today, April 22nd, is Earth Day. Since the first Earth Day was celebrated in 1970, this special day has grown into a global event observed by a billion people in nearly 200 countries each year. The rising public concern about the environment led to the establishment of the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of laws to protect the environment. The following decades saw litigation over the scope of those laws, and today's featured book examines what the author calls the most important environmental law case ever decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. In an unexpected triumph for the plaintiffs, the court agreed that the Clean Air Act required the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases. Richard Lazarus brings us the story of the landmark decision, Massachusetts versus EPA, and the people who guided the suit up to the highest court in the land. Richard J. Lazarus is the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law at Harvard University, where he teaches courses on environmental law and Supreme Court decision making. He's represented the government and environmental groups in 40 Supreme Court cases and has presented oral argument in 14. For 10 years, he's been co-teaching with Chief Justice John Roberts a course on the history of the Supreme Court. Lazarus was the founding director of the Supreme Court Institute, which prepares attorneys for oral argument in over 90% of the cases brought before the Supreme Court. Now let's hear from Richard Lazarus. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to participate uh, in this event sponsored by the National Archives. Uh, national Archives is itself, as we all know, a national treasure, a place I've spent many hours doing the kind of archival research that is the foundation of, of this book talk, actually. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is my recently published book. It's called The Rule of Five, uh, Making Climate History uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the talk will be divided into three parts. Uh, first, the arc of the story, my overall goal in writing the book. Uh, second, I want to highlight just parts of the book's story, provide you a sense of the book's voice, what makes the story, I think, so engaging, and also what makes the story uh, so important. And third, an unanticipated challenge I had in writing the book, and then how I chose to address that challenge. All right, the story's arc and its primary objective. The book is divided into 20 chapters, followed by an epilogue. Uh, the arc, it literally begins with a guy named Joe, and its story ends with the Supreme Court ruling uh, that made history. Uh, the most important uh, environmental law case ever decided by the United States Supreme Court, it's called Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, often referred to as environmental law's own Brown Board of Education a case which not only transformed U.S. climate change law, but had worldwide impact. Now, my primary objectives of writing this book were twofold. First, I wanted to write a book for the first time, actually, for a popular audience, who revealed what makes Supreme Court advocacy so challenging, uh, so fascinating, and from both sides of the electorate, where the advocate stands in front of the court, but then the also side, the other side, behind the curtains, where the justice to sit in their chambers, and they meet together in the conference room. But I also want to open a window and let the general public inside to see the extraordinary amount of strategy, maneuvering, and conflict, the personal and professional drama, not from bad motives, but just because when you're at the United States Supreme Court, the stakes are very high. I also want to write a book to a general audience to reveal what's made it so difficult for our country to address climate change why it's proven so hard, all for reasons most people don't know, and why for that reason this case is so important. 
It is no more important environmental issue facing the U.S. or the world today uh, than climate change. And the coronavirus underscores there's no escaping the need for global cooperation for these kinds of global threats. So I began researching the book in 2015-2016. Uh, I wrote it in 2018-2019. I approached the research for this book the way I would a Supreme Court brief, which is scorched earth, <laughs> scorched earth research. I interviewed everybody. Uh, the Clinton administration officials, the Bush administration officials, the lawyers on both sides. I interviewed judges. I interviewed justices. Uh, the only thing I wouldn't do is I would not interview any law clerk unless the judge or justice gave permission. I can't do that as a law professor because I would tell my students never to do that. Uh, so I always ask permission before I would talk to anybody. I also saw all the underlying documents. I ended up knowing far more about this case than any, including the participants themselves. I used public record requests, but most of what I got was voluntary for people. Boxes and boxes and boxes, jump drives, emails back and forth, handwritten notes, draft briefs, basically everything. All right, so here are a few highlights from the book, the illustrative parts of the story. Chapter one, of course, the opening scene. It's October 1999. After a year delay, Joe Mendelson walks from his Capitol office down the EPA and hand delivers a petition. A petition he had worked on and finished a year before, but had filed because of pressure. One he wrote at night, literally sitting by his daughter's crib, working on it. What did this petition do? It demanded the Clinton EPA. It demanded the Clinton EPA, that's the Clinton administration, 1999 regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles. Joe, at this point, was simply fed up by the lack of action by the Clinton administration on the climate issue. So who was Joe Mendelson? He was a young public interest lawyer who worked for a public interest organization no one had ever heard of. The Center for Technology Assessment had a total of five employees, some full-time, some part-time. Uh, they worked paycheck to paycheck and quite often for no paycheck at all. They had small offices in Capitol Hill from which they had been evicted just a couple weeks before for violating local zoning ordinances. And Joe again worked very much alone. None of the powerful environmental groups, Natural Resource Defense Council, Sierra Club, Earth Justice, none supported what he was trying to do. In fact, they actively opposed him. He even tried at one point to cut off his funding. And this center did not have much funding. But Joe refused to bend. Uh, he walked down to EPA. He filed this petition to ban the EPA Act. His feeling was these national groups weren't his bosses. They couldn't tell him what to do. So he pulled the trigger. He hand filed a petition. The petition made its way to the docket room. It was formally received in EPA by a docket clerk named Janie Poole. She put in a cart, a metal cart, uh, and it rolled down to the general counsel's office in EPA. No one then imagined that eight years later, that petition would arrive in the United States Supreme Court. Interestingly, though, and I discovered this in the research, there was reason to think the EPA might grant the petition. Not the Clinton administration, who deliberately ignored it the entire time they were in office, but the Bush administration once it took office. Because George Bush, when he ran against Al Gore in the 2000 election, in September 2000, he campaigned with a promise to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. He decided to go to the left to go during the campaign. And he pointed to his cabinet people who were hawkish on addressing climate change. He named his head of EPA, Christine Todd Whitman. Christine Todd Whitman back then was a household name. She was presidential timber. She had been governor of New Jersey, widely touted. Uh, as possible future presidential candidate, a Republican, and actually had been close to becoming named Bush's own vice president. She took the job because of climate change. She felt so seriously about the issue. Secretary of State then Colin Powell. Powell thought that climate change was a pressing issue of enormous national security significance. He had a briefing on climate change within one week of taking office at the end of January 2001. Congress Rice, who was national security advisor, she also shared Powell's view on the seriousness and urgency of climate change. But no one was more hawkish 
than Bush's Treasury Secretary, Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill, when he interviewed for the job for Bush, told them how he cared about the climate issue, what most important. And Paul O'Neill felt so strongly about this that when they had the first cabinet meeting at the end of January, just after the inauguration, January 2001, Paul O'Neill went to the White House early. He put a copy of a speech he delivered a year or so before in front of the chair of every member of the camp. It was his speech on comparing the threat of climate change to nuclear holocaust. They all thought this was it. They were going to act on this issue. And then this guy came in, Dick Cheney. But Dick Cheney had come in from the Halliburton, from the energy industry. And within two weeks, he persuaded George Bush to renege on his campaign pledge. Without consulting with anyone at EPA, Christine Tuggle and all of them knew nothing about it. And Bush did that. Uh, and what Cheney did was he orchestrated Bush to send a letter to Republican members of the Senate, which said, not only am I not going to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, but I don't think I have a legal authority to do it under the Clean Air Act. He had Bush not just answer a policy question, but a legal question. The meaning of the Clean Air Act and the word blue. We'll find out that was a stumble by Bush and by Cheney. But they consulted none of the lawyers when they did this. The petition EPA denied on August, uh, September 2003, they had no choice but to deny, given the president's decision. Christine Powell Whitman's career, which is why many of you never heard of her, was finished. As a result, she was humiliated on the national stage and the national stage. At this point, though, then, the case went to court. There was nothing easy or smooth about the pathway ultimately to the Supreme Court. But by the time the case reached the courts, Joe Mendelson was no longer alone. There were hundreds of lawyers on his side, for about a dozen states and more than two dozen national environmental groups. They called themselves the carbon dioxide warriors. In the first round, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, they lost. They lost that case. The D.C. Circuit, an opinion joined by two of the judges, Judges Randolph and Judge David Sentel, ruled that EPA had lawfully denied the petition that Joe had filed. After that loss, everyone but one attorney on the environmental side, everyone thought that was it. They should end the case, not seek any further review. Only one attorney thought differently. That was Jim Milton, whose picture you see, the head of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, Environmental Office. Jim was the only one who thought they should roll the dice, seek further review, not acquiesce in a loss, throw basically the football equivalent of a Hail Mary and see if they might get further review, including the Supreme Court. Everyone else thought, terrible idea, they would risk a major loss in the Supreme Court. Better to just fold this tent they had not lost with any major press in the staff of the D.C. Circuit and bring another case at another time. Milky was under enormous pressure not to file any further reviews. The president of the Natural Resource Defense Council, very distinguished, highly regarded individual, Francis Beinecke, called his boss, Milky's boss, the Attorney General, and called Milky himself and said, the future of the environmental movement is on your head if you do this. That's how strongly people felt that this was a mistake. But Milky, they had no power to stop him. Anyone, any one of the parties could file. So Milky filed the cert petition, and they all joined it. They joined it not because they thought it was a good idea. They wanted to help. They wanted to control him, control the litigation. They also there wasn't a chance the court would actually grant review in the case. But the court did just that. On June 26, 2006. The Supreme Court granted review of Massachusetts versus EPA. All the attorneys on the side of the petition, the environmental groups and Massachusetts, they were just stunned. They couldn't believe it. They never fought the court grant review, and for good reason. This was the first time the Supreme Court had granted review in an environmental case over the government's opposition since 1971. That's 35 years. That's the last time they did it, and they did it in 1971, then the environmental groups lost uh, the case. So they looked at, they were excited, but at the same time, Jim Wickey thought, oh my God, what have I done? 
because it takes four votes to grant review. It takes five votes to win in the United States Supreme Court. That's the title of the book, The Rule of Five. And you never know who the four votes are who voted to grant review. They could be granting review not to give you a win, but to just the opposite, to do exactly what the environmental groups that most of the states felt was at risk, and that is to give you a big loss instead. Now, chapter 12 of the book is called The Lure of the Lecture. Fast forward a little bit. The briefs have now been filed by the environmentalists in the states. They filed the briefs. They worked on them in the summer of 2006. But once they filed the briefs, then a huge battle developed over who should present oral argument for the United States Supreme Court for the states and the environmentalists. In the lower courts, they allow more than one advocate. Supreme Court is almost always allows one. No matter how many parties on one side, they want one. They don't want many. So some things were easy here. Everyone agreed about one thing. The best person should give the argument. They also agreed, right, that the best person should give the best possible argument. That's where the agreement ended. Huge dispute over who that best person was. And it came down to this. The states tend to favor one individual, and the environmental groups tend to favor another. It was a good faith disagreement. Two highly qualified candidates. One could make a strong case for either one of them. And it's not unusual in the United States Supreme Court because they only allow one minority parties to have this kind of conflict. But sometimes it turns out to be a coin flip, really a coin flip, to decide who's going to argue the case. The stakes are high, the emotions are high, uh, the egos are high, and the ambitions are high. One can make one's career uh, over a major Supreme Court argument. But in this case, and I've seen these disputes all the time, in this case, the oral argument conflict became extraordinarily destructive. I've seen a lot of them. I've never seen one as intense as this. So intense that that was in October 2006. That's 14 and a half years ago. And the people on either side of that dispute are still not speaking to each other. And they were very good friends and colleagues before this happened. Even after it seemingly settled over who would argue, and that was me, Jim Milkey, the Massachusetts Attorney General's office, and argued the case, even the Council of Record, seven, maybe nine days before the actual argument, after weeks of preparation, the environmental groups attempted a coup. They called Jim Milkey on a Saturday morning, uh, and they said, Jim, you've got to get off the case. You're not good enough for this case. You're not doing a good job in the moot courts. Uh, you're going to end up losing this case for us. That's a crazy idea. You don't. You can't replace your advocate like a week and a half before the actual oral argument. It's not going to work. There's not enough time to prepare anybody else. But the craziest of the idea that you would try that underscores the depth of distrust among the people on the same team. The environmental groups, they had worked on this issue for a long time. There was no issue more important to them than the climate change issue. This was their Supreme Court case, along with the states. And they thought it was going to go down because the state AG person wasn't good enough to argue the case. So the motivation is understandable. The solution they had is unfathomable. Milky heard this and basically said, that's not going to happen. But imagine what it's like to get that call just before you're about to present an argument in the United States Supreme Court. The next chapter is described the oral argument itself. And these chapters are designed to give the reader a sense, of, first of all, the stunning physical setting of the courtroom. Uh, it's extraordinary grandeur. If you haven't gone, you should make sure you get a chance when they're back in the courtroom again, of course. Uh, the architect for the Supreme Court building was Cass Gilbert, and he did a phenomenal job. Uh, but as much as the courtroom, the whole building, has this enormous grandeur to it, with these friezes and columns, it's also coupled with physical intimacy. When you stand at the lectern in front of the justices, you are 74 inches away. There's no court I've ever argued in where you're as close as you are in the U.S. Supreme Court. The advocate literally leaned over, put out his or her hand, 
and the Chief Justice could lean over, put out her his hand, and they could touch. And the bench itself is a bow, so it wraps around you. Uh, the extraordinary give and take between the justices is sometimes I try to give in the book, the Justice of the Advocates, uh, but also in the justices themselves. Because by tradition, the justices do not speak about a case until they get to a lawyer. So they don't yet know what their colleagues on the bench think. And the hour of oral argument is the longest time they're ever going to talk about the case today. So it's the first time and the longest time. When they get to the conference, I'll we'll talk about in a few moments, they actually vote in order of seniority, most senior to least senior, without any general discussion of the case. The votes didn't really happen. There is no pre-deliberation. The oral argument is when it happens. So the advocate's challenge is considerable. Because the opportunity is amazing, right? They are there in the room when the justices are first talking about the case among themselves. And the justices are talking about the case through the advocates by asking questions. So the advocate has to decide how to frame the issue in the way most likely to win the case. There's often a huge difference in the way you can frame it. One way you frame it, you could win. Another way you frame it, you could lose. You have to anticipate all the hard questions you're going to get from the justice and develop very crisp, very efficient answers. The norm these days is to receive 50 to 75 questions in 30 minutes. Not with this current telephonic system of the pandemic, but the way it's always been done and will soon be done again, I believe, next fall. The justice's questions are extraordinarily hard. Whatever you think of the ideology of different justices, they are really smart ones. And it's a lawyer's equivalent of trying to hit the major league baseball pitch when it comes in. Uh, and you've got to answer quickly. If you're answering 50 to 75 questions in 30 minutes, do the math. The question itself is going to take up a lot of your time, which means you have to answer your questions right front load, one point. Thesis, support, support, transition. Thesis, support, support, transition, without missing a beat. And the book describes your argument in detail. Uh, Milky's back and forth uh, with Scalia, and the Chief Justice in particular. 23 questions from Justice Scalia alone. Uh, what I want to do, other than show you, of course, the justices, is, is give you the beginning of the oral argument. And listen to it. Hear what happens at the very beginning of Jim Milky's argument. Mr. Milky. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, if I may, I'd like to frame the, uh, the merits very quickly and then turn immediately to standing. Although the case before you arises in an important policy area, it turns on ordinary principles of statutory interpretation and administrative law. EPA made a decision based on two grounds, both of which constitute plain errors of law reviewable under any standard. He's not asking the court to pass judgment on the science of climate change, or to order EPA to set emission standards. We simply want EPA to revisit the rulemaking petition based on permissible considerations. All right. Imagine you were a climate activist. And you know, here's the biggest case. You have, as they did, you slept overnight on the cold sidewalk outside the United States Supreme Court the evening of November 28th to get one of the very few coveted seats available to the public. You walk into the courtroom, and you're waiting, right? And then your champion stands up before the United States Supreme Court and says that, right? Um, yeah, 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 this case arises in court policy area, but don't worry, think about that. We're not asking the court to pass judgment on the science of climate change. We're not asking you to order EPA to do anything at all about climate change. They have to set emission standards. All we want is to have EPA visit the rulemaking petition again, but based on permissible consideration. That's all. But you would expect your, your champion to tell the court about how important climate change is, how it's the threat it presents to the United States and the world, right? to wake them up to this issue. But instead, all he does is say, 
But this one, it's just an administrative law case. It's ordinary principle administrative law. It's not a big deal to send it back to EPA. So why does he do this? Because he's being a really good lawyer. It might make the heart of climate activists, it might make my heart and many of your hearts go pitter-patter to think about climate change and how important it is. But Milky knows he's not giving a speech to climate activists. He's not a campaign rep. He's not testifying before Congress. He's talking to nine justices in the United States Supreme Court. He needs their votes. And climate change is not what makes their heart go pitter-patter. What makes their heart go pitter-patter is administrative law. That's what they think and care about every day in so many other cases. He needs their votes. And that's what he's trying to do. The best environmental lawyers are not the best environmentalists. They're the best lawyers. And he has to find a way to frame this case to win it. And to win this case, that means making it about an issue which he could get five justices to vote for. So he's making it about ordinary principle ministerial. He's making a small ass, easy case, not actually do very much, just this little thing based on ordinary principles. If they win it, as we'll see, they'll go to town with it politically. But first, they have to win it. The last chapter of the book shift the story from one side of the lectern to the other. From the side where the advocates argue to where the justices meet afterwards, behind the massive red curtains of the court. This is where the justices and the law clerks work in their chambers. The book in particular describes what happened at conference. This is where the justices met privately two days after the argument. When they meet at conference, no one's in the room but the justices themselves. They have assigned seats, of course. They sit by seniority. The Chief Justice most Senior sits at one end, at this point Justice John Paul Stevens at the other, and then around in seniority. Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, uh, Souter, Ginsburg, Breyer. Alito then was a junior justice. That meant he took the notes uh, of what was said, and he answered the root door that he would not uh, on, on the door. Uh, this is entirely confidential proceeding. But they discuss the case briefly, and they vote. The Chief goes first, he summarizes the case, and he votes. Then Stevens, then Scalia, then Ken. If you're the last justice, no one cares about your vote at all if they've already figured out the result of why they're. Um, that's actually why they asked so many questions at all. Scalia joined the court in 1986. He discovered he was coming up last. The cases were decided before he even got a chance to open his mouth. So he switched to oral argument. And he made oral argument the place he was going to try to lobby other justices, which is what everyone does now. They went around the room, they voted, it was five to four. Justice Kennedy supplied the fifth vote. So it's John Paul Stevens, uh, Justice Kennedy, Souter, Ginsburg, uh, and Bryant. Uh, that's the majority. Now, when that happens, that's just called the opening bell. That's the vote at conference. That's the preliminary result. What then has to happen is very important. Because the senior justice in the majority, in this case with John Paul Stevens, he has to decide who's going to write the court's opinion in the case. And Stevens here faced, was faced with a real dilemma. I met with him in Florida uh, to talk about uh, his decision here. Because he had one of two obvious choices. The first was assign it to himself. A big case. One of the few big cases, the more liberal progressive members of the court sort of were the majority that year. He could assign it to himself. He felt importantly about this case. It was very important. Or he could do the more strategic thing and assign it to Justice Kennedy. Because that's the way you make sure you keep the vote. Because justices change their votes all the time between the preliminary vote and the final vote once they start seeing the draft opinions. And Justice Kennedy was known for changing his mind in cases. He has changed his mind in big civil rights cases. He changed his mind in environmental cases. People who had a majority would lose him during the opinion writing process. The best way to keep his vote, assign him the opinion. Because then you know he'll write the opinion the way that he agrees with. He also will feel some institutional responsibility to stay 
with the opinion, given that that's been his assignment. People still change sometimes, but far more rarely. So Stevens had to decide what to do, himself or Kennedy. If he made it himself, he then had to work hard to make sure he didn't lose Kennedy's vote. And just the year before, Scalia had lost Kennedy's vote in a big environmental case between the time of conference uh, and the final opinion. Stevens said, I'm assigned to myself. Why? Stevens told me this case was really important to him. He said, I'm a Republican. And I can't understand why so many members of my party are not taking the climate issue seriously. He also said this was an opinion he wanted to write to the American people. He said, sometimes I write opinions for different audiences. Quite often it's just for the lawyers and the parties. Sometimes it's for, like, law school and law students. This one, I want to write to the American people. I feel so strongly about this issue. So Stevens took on the ownership of the opinion, but then he had to not lose Bright Kennedy's vote. I refer to it as an octogenarian bow-tie Jedi master uh, in terms of what's Ken, what uh, sorry, Stevens pulled off in this case. This guy was well in his upper 80s uh, at this time. So what Stevens did is he circulated his first draft. His first draft got, including his own, four votes. The dissent, two dissents by Scalia and the chief, also got four votes. Kennedy did not yet join the opinion. So Stevens circulated a second draft, four votes. Third draft, four votes. Fourth draft, four votes. Stevens has to make compromise. He has to include language to try to get Kennedy over. You look at the final thing, you'll see him giving a group hug to Kennedy in prior things Kennedy had written, try to get Kennedy in and over. Fifth draft, four votes. Sixth draft, four votes. Seventh draft, four votes. At this point, he's making enough compromises to get Kennedy to try to come. The Justice Souter sort of upset by some of his drafts, a, his own concurring opinion, which goes after EPA quite aggressively for not doing more in this case, with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg joins. Draft number eight, Kennedy joins. And then Stevens gets Kennedy, but gets Souter to withdraw his opinion. But he succeeded. And he wrote the opinion as a call to action. As much as the environmental groups and states had said this is not a big case about climate change in the last EPA, Stevens wrote it all about climate change. All about what respected scientists believe about climate change. He wrote this to try to trigger a whole lot of action by the government. Uh, the next chapter talks about how this case made this it didn't make history in the first instance under, under the Bush administration. It was under the Obama administration. The Obama administration took the Bush administration's loss in Massachusetts versus the EPA, and they ran with it. Almost every single significant part of their climate program to reduce the nation's greenhouse gas emissions was on the basis of Massachusetts versus EPA. Because this is what President Obama knew. One could not successfully address the climate issue unless you could get a nationwide, so a global agreement on climate change. No one nation can do it by itself. The, the science doesn't allow any nation to do it because emissions come from all over the world. The U.S. may be most responsible for the emissions historically, but you have to have the whole world cooperate and reduce emissions to have any serious effort to address it. But what the president also knew was the rest of the world was not going to do it because they had shown they weren't going to do it. The US, the U.S. took the first big step. Because the U.S. was disproportionately responsible for most of the emissions already accumulated in the atmosphere. So until the U.S. took action, no one was going to do it. And he had until December 2015. He could do it in four years. He had over a second term. He had until the agreement, sorry, the meeting in Paris of almost 200 nations of the world on climate in December 2015 to demonstrate to the rest of the world he could get it done. And that's what he did. Uh, putting the last pieces in place in the fall of 2015, all based on Massachusetts versus EPA. And it was because of that ruling 
that actually the Paris Agreement, 195 nations, happened. Now, when I first wrote the book, let's say researching the book, and back in 2016, uh, I thought I knew my ending. My ending was going to be the Agreement in Paris in 2015, uh, as a result of this historic ruling by the Supreme Court. Uh, I did not then anticipate, but in 2015, the results of the 2016 election. Now, perhaps if I had spent a little less time in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I would have had a better sense uh, of where the nation was going uh, in November 2016. Um, but I was completely caught off guard. Then, uh, as an author, I had a challenge. I hadn't expected. What do I do with it? What do I do with the election of Donald Trump in November 2016? Um, I knew it three things. I knew first, I had to acknowledge it. I couldn't write the book and end it uh, with the Paris Agreement. I had to acknowledge it. I had to explain its relevance. Second, I knew I did not want this book to become yet another book about Donald Trump. Or otherwise, more importantly, that the book read the latest event of the moment. I was trying to tell a more timeless story, and not a story that would depend on the last thing that just happened in the Trump presidency. Why? Because of my third goal. That was to have a story that was meaningful to readers far past the presidency of Donald Trump. For readers years from now, who could enjoy and learn from the thrilling story told here about Supreme Court advocacy and climate change. Perhaps even a reader in the future who might even say in the distant future, now, who is that Donald Trump guy again? So that's the role of the epilogue. To try to place Trump uh, in perspective and the lessons the book story has for all of us. Uh, so what are those lessons? Uh, first, what difference one person can make in making history? Second, even the most historic U.S. Supreme Court ruling is not enough. It takes, as it should, more than the votes of five justices on the Supreme Court to truly achieve transformative legal change in the United States. The case of Brown Board of Education, enormous promise in 1954. But obviously, right, it did not solve the problem of race discrimination in the United States. It took far more than that to begin to address that issue. It took a lot of statute, but all it takes is to change an attitude. Massachusetts EPA, also enormous problems. But to achieve truly transformative, long-lasting change requires votes. But not the votes of just justices or just five justices, but of individual voters. That's how you end up with laws like the Civil Rights Act. That's how you end up with the climate change law. And at least in this country, that's as it should be. The Supreme Court of the United States can jump starts, but it can't complete the job. And that's why it's so important that people vote. And that's also, of course, why the election this past November was so historic for environmental law. Thanks very much.